This video is looking at how you calculate the sample sizes for a t-test when quantitative statistics. So why do you calculate sample size in the first place rather than just grabbing 100 people and seeing what they think? So if you go into the street and measure the height of 20 people, you can calculate the average height. You then have to ask yourself, does this number represent all of the people living in the UK or the city or the village or anything? Now, that's not going to be true. Now, maybe the local basketball team walked by and you have abnormally tall people or short people. You know, it's there's a element of chance in there if you have a small sample. So you need to have a large enough sample to say that your results are not likely down to chance and they are generally good. So before you conduct any quantitative research, calculate your sample size. This is really important because it tells you what you need to do. If you've got a very large sample, your method is going to be very different to if you have a small sample. So let's have a look at t-test. Just to cover this, um, if you're not too certain, you have two kinds. So firstly, the independent samples. And this is where you compare the mean scores of two different groups. So you could answer the question, um, did um, males form better or worse than females during end of year exams. You also have paired samples, so you're comparing the same group on two different occasions. So it could be, did the students' um, grades increase from year one to year two? Same people, just different years. So two flavors we have there, independent samples and paired samples. I'm going to go through both versions in this video. Now. To visualize this, you can say that group one, so we're going to call them uh, males, are the red, and they are there, and group B are blue on the right. We can see that in this just example, the scores of the males are lower than the scores of the females on the right. The two distributions are separate. If there was no difference between the groups, the two distributions, the two curves, would be overlapping. So the further the two are apart, the more different they are. And that's what we're trying to detect. Are the two groups having different distributions? And if so, how, by how much? Um, there's something else you need to know, which is one or two tails. Now, you can do a one-tailed t-test or a two-tailed t-test. So, tails refer to the start and end point of distributions. So, a two-tailed investigation means that you consider both the lowest and the highest part of the distribution. If you look at the picture on the right, you'll see these areas are shaded in. I got this off website. Actually, there's a link there if you are interested. So, I'm not claiming this is my own creation under fair use. Um, you also have a one-tailed investigation, which means only one of those tails is being investigated. So unless you have a really solid reason to believe that the direction of your relationship is one-directional, just use two. If you're in doubt, use two-tailed. So that's my tip here. If you asked, two tails is always better than one. Uh, the other thing you need to think about is effect size. So you will run a t-test and you might find a significant difference between your groups. So males have a different distribution to females. But the question is, how big is that difference? Is it a small difference or a large difference? So you uh, have a small difference and that might be really significant. If you look at the table on the right, that's 1% of the variance. Now, if you're trying to develop a new cancer treatment um, and the old one is not particularly is really really expensive and you develop a new treatment which is cheaper and is more effective with a small effect size then you that small effect size will mean people will live while saving money so that's actually really good but if we're looking at um, drastically improving a process then a small effect size is interesting we need a large effect size so generally what you want to do when you have um, a test is have your test a large enough sample that and it's so powerful that you can detect a small difference but you want to find a large difference so if you design your test so that it has enough power to detect a small effect size then everything is going really well so get your head around effect size um, as a general rule of thumb you don't want to take a um, effect size smaller than medium because you want to detect at least medium 
We'll see this in a few minutes. Anyhow, for a t-test, there's two things you need. You need an independent categorical variable with two groups. That could be um, gender, so male or female, or it could be condition, so um, study year 2017, study year 2018. You also need your dependent variable. Scale is better. You can use Likert, but if you want to be really robust, scale is better. So exam results out of 100% is a classic one to use. But to actually calculate the sample size, you don't need these this data. You just need G star power, and I'll put a link to that in the description below, which is fantastic software. I'll be showing you in a second. And you need your desired effect size. So point two, if you want to detect a small effect size, that's your gold standard. Um, or point five, if you want to detect a medium. Now you could go larger to detect a large effect size only, and we'll look at that in a bit. But frankly, let's not go there. Point two or point five. So let's go and have a look at G star power. Here I am with my G star power already opened, and I'm going to go and talk you through this. Um, I've already set this up, but we'll open the menus individually. So here we have um, the family. You need to select t-test. There's lots of different tests you can do with this program, but t-test is one for us. Now, the next part which I haven't get scared with is statistical test. You open this menu and there's a whole load of different things. So you can read into this a lot more, read the manual, read online, but there's these two here. So difference between two dependent means, which is matched pairs, that's your um, paired samples, and then you've got difference between two independent means, and that's your standard t-test of independence. We're going to start with independence, so the two groups. Second one, we need the type of power analysis. There's lots of things you can do, but the one we want is a priori compute required sample size. So, now we set those up, we have a box here we want to enter data into. Here we have about tails, now as I said before, if in doubt, go for two. Then we have the effect size, so I'm going to start by designing a really good test where we can detect small effect sizes. Um, so point two. The alpha error probability, that's going to be set at 0 0.05 as standard. Now, if you want to be really rigorous, you can go for 0.25, which is a smaller alpha. But for most of your work, you're going to be wanting an alpha of 0 0.05. That's your universally recognized standard. So anything with significance below 0 0.05, you can take as being a difference. This part here, didn't actually cover this in the part before. But this is how much power is in your test. So this is your ability to detect differences between groups. So if we have, it's by default, it's 0.95, and that is excellent. So we'll leave that there for now. We'll come back to this in a, se in a second. The next part is the allocation ratio, which is n says n2 divided by n1. That sounds scary, but all it means is how many people are in the groups. So if we have a value of 1, then we're going to have the same number of people in each group, same males, same females. If you did um, your paired samples, so um, student scores between 2017 and 2018, you're going to have it as 1 because it's the same students. Anyhow, We'll leave those um, as the, that for now and go down to the bottom right and say calculate. So what it's done is it's saying that if we want to have be able to detect small effect sizes with an alpha of 0 0.05, with a really nice high powered study, the same number of people in each group, we need 1,302 people. We see here that we got 651 per group. So that's kind of the basic answer. Now, I'm going to play around with these numbers so you get a good feel about what they do and what they mean. Starting with the ratio allocation, if I put 2 in and then recalculate, you'll see that um, group 2 is much, much larger than group 1. Actually, it's twice as large. Uh, if we put you know, 10, <laughs> calculate, then we've got 10 times the amount of people in group 2 as group 1. The total sample size, obviously, is those put together. You can see quite clearly that if you have the same number of people in each group, your total sample size is smaller. So try and go for the um, same number of people per group 
if you can, unless you have a theoretical reason why. So for example, if there's twice as many males as females on a course, you're going to have to put number two in, and in order to investigate the difference between male and female, you need near enough a thousand males to 500 females. That might take you a long time to collect the data, but that's what you need to do. Some people in the street is much easier. Next part we're going to look at is this thing about power. So 0.95 is standard and that's fantastic. You can actually drop that to 0.8, it's completely fine. And you'll see that our sample size has dropped to 788, so it's much, much smaller. Now that's much more achievable too. So start with a high powered one of 0.95. If you go, ah, oh, that's just not going to happen, I can't do that. It's completely fine, Let's drop that to 0.8 and you still have a really well designed sample. Next thing to look at is the error probability. You can't really go up above 0 0.5, 0 0.05, because that's just going to um, break all accepted conventions with stats. <coughs> but if you put into a lower alpha, to be very strict, you'll see that the sample size is affected. So we've gone up to 954 people. Let's just return that to how it was before and you've got 788 people. So you can see that in decreasing this number increase your sample size. The last point I'm going to look at is the effect size. So you really want to go for 0.2 effect size if you can. Um, if you look at the sample size and go, oh, that's, that's just too big, I can't collect the many people, you can put in 0 0.5 and calculate. It drops down to 128, much more manageable. However, there is a price to pay. If you collect this data and you find a significant outcome, but the outcome itself is of a small effect size, you have to forget that outcome and say it didn't happen because your test is not powerful enough to detect a small difference. You can only detect medium to large effect sizes onwards. So that's okay, but you've got to be careful with your outcome. So I'm gonna put that back to 0.2. So for this test, I reckon you could get away with 788 people um, if you want to take a small sample size. So that's how you do um, independent t-test. Let's just go and have a look at the paired samples. Now, this is slightly different, as you can see, but it's not much harder. Oh, With the um, effect size, so we can keep that as 0 0.05 as before. We got the alpha error probability is 0.05, and we got the power here as before. Now, remember, we don't have the difference between groups because it's the same people. So again, we can calculate. We need a much smaller sample, so we can get away with 54 people. If we drop the power to 0.8 and calculate, we can get away with 34 people. So this is a much, much easier test to do. You can have small numbers because you're doing it over two consecutive occasions. But that does also means that you can drop the effect size and go for 0.2. Calculate. And yeah, 200 people. So if you want to go for your gold standard on the um, uh, paired samples um, t test, you'd be looking at 327 people. Now, these are the numbers that you have to play around with for your individual test. Don't just take them from this video and say that um, Dr. Parker said that it's this, it's good. Download the program, have a play with it, and report your results in your report or your scientific paper. I hope this helps, and you know, it is one of the most fundamental steps in designing your study. Before you go and collect data, calculate your sample size, write that in your report, and then when you collect data, make sure you meet these numbers. I wish the best of luck, and more videos coming soon on these topics.